The mortgage for this place is 5000 a month. I'm sure you, Hannah, can afford it. Please take care of it. What? I raised my voice. My mother-in-law, Julia, acted surprised and theatrically shrugged her shoulders, saying, Oh, scary, pretending to be the victim. My father-in-law, Derek, glared at me and shouted, It's only fair. Let's rewind to several months ago. My name is Hannah. My husband, Matthew, and I are newlyweds. Since we both grew up in the same hometown, we decided to live somewhere in between my family home and Matthew's family home. You could say we're living close but apart. We thought it would be comforting to be within easy reach of both our families in case anything happened, but I ended up having issues with my in-laws. I first met them when Matthew and I got engaged and paid them a visit. Matthew had already warned me that he didn't get along well with his parents, saying, My parents are reckless spenders and lack common sense, to be honest. I wouldn't mind cutting ties. Still, they were Matthew's parents. Taking advice from my own parents that it would be good to meet them at least once, we went to visit. Upon arriving, Julia warmly welcomed us. She didn't seem like the reckless spender, lacking common sense, that Matthew had described. There was a bit of a cold vibe toward me, but I thought that's just how mother-in-laws are toward their son's wives. But their attitude changed in an instant when I told them where I worked. When Derek asked, So Hannah, where are you working? And I mentioned my company, their faces lit up instantly. From that moment on, they were thrilled, saying, We've got ourselves a wonderful daughter-in-law. They welcomed me as if they had completely forgotten the slightly cold treatment just moments before. On our way home, Matthew warned, Be careful around my parents. But at that time, I didn't understand what he meant. Then Matthew and I got married. A few weeks into our new life, I got a call from Julia after work. I picked up the phone and Julia quickly said, Hannah, please come over right away. We'll be waiting at home before hanging up. I thought maybe something had happened to my in-laws. So I rushed over to their house. Running in a suit in the summer heat, I was soaked in sweat. Though I was a sweaty mess, I rang the doorbell and a smiling Julia greeted me, making me feel a bit relieved. Thank you for coming. She smiled as she welcomed me in. I wonder why they called me over. Sitting in the living room with a cup of coffee, my in-laws walk in with a laptop smiling. What's going on? Is there something wrong with the laptop? No, actually, we have something we want you to buy for us, Anna. Buy for you? Confused by the unexpected request, I'm left speechless. Ignoring my bafflement, Derek opens the laptop. Displayed are pictures of high-end designer bags and luxury watches. So you want me to buy these for you? Yes, I'd like the bag and your father-in-law wants the watch. Why should I buy these things for you? My question prompts a sudden change in their facial expressions. The smiling faces turn stone cold and I feel a sense of dread. We gave you the treasure that is our son, didn't we? You could at least buy us this much in return. You work for a well-known company, Hannah. You're wealthy. Just buy them. No complaints. Frustrated, I shake my head. I can't justify buying such expensive gifts when it's not even a special occasion. Nonetheless, they keep pushing, eventually yelling at me from both sides. Overwhelmed, I end up caving in and making the purchase. The moment I buy the items, they return to their pleasant demeanor. It's hot. Take your time and relax before you go, they say, which somehow makes it even more unsettling. Since I gave in once, they keep summoning me to buy various things for them. Each time, I try to refuse, but ultimately, my fear of being yelled at from both sides made me give in. Matthew had told me he was often pestered for money by his parents when we were dating. But I always hesitated to bring it up because he clearly despised his parents. Feeling trapped and unsure what to do, another call from them comes in. I went to my in-law's house, wondering what I would be forced to buy this time. I knew from past experiences that if I didn't respond to the calls, I would receive a series of line messages like a demon. As usual, I was led into the living room, expecting my step-parents to bring their laptops again. 
But this time, it was different. This time, they bring out a stack of receipts. What's this? This is one month of our living expenses. We thought you could cover it for us. What? You are wealthy, Hannah. You can afford this. Saying so, Derek hands me a note with the total amount. I did the calculations for you this time. Next time, just do it yourself. The sum includes utilities, groceries, and other bills. I can't. I shake my head. I shouldn't have to bear your living expenses just because I'm married to your son. No sooner had the words left my mouth than I regretted them. Bracing from more yelling, Julia suddenly burst into tears, collapsing on the table. Why won't you give us money? How could you be so cruel? Derek, who's hugging a loudly sobbing Julia, yelled, This is outrageous. People usually send money to their parents willingly, and we even calculated how much you should give us. Both Derek shouting and Julia's wailing ring in my ears. I just want to leave this place. I want it to be over. Unable to tolerate my in-laws' incessant complaining, I find myself handing over money yet again. But my funds are not infinite. At this rate, my savings will be drained by my in-laws. As I head home, I'm determined to talk to Matthew. But when I see him, I realize he's not in the state for any discussion. Though he came home before me, Matthew was just sitting in the dark, staring blankly. Matthew, what's wrong? Turn on some lights, at least. When I flip on the lights, Matthew turns his face towards me. What's going on? I ask a visibly drained Matthew, who replies, I've been laid off. Matthew had been troubled by conflicts with his boss for some time. Since we work in the same field, it wasn't surprising that Matthew was laid off. It must have been his disagreeable boss who put him on the chopping block. I can't add any more stress to Matthew's life right now. I keep the situation with my in-laws to myself. Weeks later, my in-laws summon me again, but this time it's different. Instead of their home, I'm called to a different location. And there it is, a mansion that stands out even in a suburban neighborhood. After double-checking the address and my map again, I ring the doorbell. A voice says, Come in! It's unmistakably Julia. Why is Julia here? Although I have many questions, I enter when Julia says I can. Julia greets me in the entryway. Welcome. Whose house is this, I ask? Julia said with a surprised look on her face. It's our house, says Julia, looking shocked. I'm dumbfounded. My in-laws had been begging me for money, yet they've managed to build this mansion? As I'm guided into the living room, Derek is there. I sit down opposite them. How did you build a house like this? We took out a loan. Even old folks like us found a lender willing to lend. How will I repay the loan? Asking you to help with that is why we invited you today, Derek laughs. The mortgage is 5000 a month. You can handle that, Hannah. What? When I raise my voice, Julia dramatically flinches, exclaiming, Oh, you're scaring me! Derek glares at me. It's to be expected. We're not working. Do you think we can pay 5000 on our own? Don't take a loan you can't repay. How did you even get approved? I shudder at the thought that they might have borrowed from a disreputable source. Julia pleads. Please, Hannah, don't be such a terrible daughter-in-law and abandon two old people like us. I get up from my seat. I can't pay this time. 5000 a month is impossible. Excuse me. Hey, wait, Derek shouts, but I'm out the door. Scared that my in-laws would chase after me, I ran back home and quickly locked the door. I rushed to Matthew, who was working on his computer in his room. Well, you scared me. Welcome back, Anna. What are you up to? Working, actually. My side gig is doing really well, so I'm thinking of going solo. I should have told you sooner, Anna. Is that okay? Matthew had been down since getting restructured at work, but he was stronger than I thought. With this new Matthew, I felt like I could finally open up about Derek and Julia. That's what I thought. Matthew, it's about Derek and Julia. The moment I started talking, my tears started flowing. Matthew, surprised, gently rubbed my back and asked, What happened? As I sobbed like a child, I explained the situation to Matthew, who then sighed in frustration. Ugh, my parents. When will they stop tormenting people? It turns out Matthew had endured similar treatment from my in-laws before we got married. Since he had calmed down after getting married, he thought that his parents had also become calmer as they got older. 
Who would have thought they'd be targeting you, Hannah? What should we do? At this rate, we'll have to pay Derek and Julia $5,000 every month. Matthew thought for a moment, then said, Let's move. If we move and change our numbers, we can cut them off for good. But if they come to my workplace, we're done for. They even know where I work. Feeling cornered, Matthew made another suggestion. In that case... Weeks went by, and then I got a call from Julia. Hannah, where are you? Your old address has a different name on it. They said you're not at work. The due date for the loan is long past. I calmly responded. I'm not paying. What? The loan. I'm not paying it. Figure it out yourselves. And by the way, this number will soon be out of service. I'm not done talking. Ignoring her, I hung up. Matthew and I immediately changed our phone numbers, cutting off all contact for good. To escape my in-laws, we moved abroad. We only shared our new contact information with my parents and close friends. What Matthew had suggested was for me to quit my job and move overseas. Matthew had made it big in the online business world, allowing me to quit my job. We were doing just fine on his income alone. Now I work part-time in a foreign country to earn some extra cash. I got word from a former coworker that my in-laws had showed up at my workplace yelling, Where's Hannah? They even got escorted out by the police. They got off with just a warning, but my coworker said they looked desperate and it was scary. Why had my in-laws become so frantic? We found out a year after moving abroad when I received a mysterious call. It was from Julia. I didn't recognize the number, but when I picked it up, it was Julia on the other end. Hello, Hannah, please, you've got to help us. Somehow my phone number had gotten to Julia. I rushed to Matthew, switched on the speaker, and we both listened. Apparently, my in-laws had borrowed money from a shady company and were facing forced labor for not paying it back. Is Matthew listening? Please transfer at least 30000 or we could die from forced labor. Absolutely not, Matthew responded. I've suffered enough from their lack of sense all my life. They didn't even support my education, yet took most of the money I earned. I have no love left for them. Let them face the consequences. But Matthew, don't say that. Please help mom. To make up for their past, they should suffer. Matthew's words left Julia crying loudly. Then a male voice came on. Okay, we're taking your parents. I was too stunned to speak, but Matthew calmly said, Please go ahead. We never found out where they took my in-laws, but nobody in the family even looked for them. We certainly didn't want to find them. They were pretty sturdy for old folks, so they're probably still working hard somewhere. That's what I think. Life for us has been peaceful ever since. Matthew seems more energized in his work and with my assistance on the side. He even started his own small business. We built a big house overseas, even hired a maid. We're expecting another member in our family soon. Your belly is getting bigger. Yes. Would it be okay to go back to my parents' place and show them their grandchild? We've only been talking over the phone ever since we left because of the in-laws. Since we ran away from his parents, we've only been able to talk to my parents over the phone. Matthew, whom I thought would never want to go back, immediately said, Sure, let's go. You're okay with that? You don't mind? As long as my parents aren't there, anywhere is heaven to me. Smiling, Matthew gently stroked my belly. I want to meet you soon. When I saw Matthew smiling as if he had been rid of that possession, I felt from the bottom of my heart how glad I was to be able to cut ties with his parents. Mommy! I heard my daughter's voice, filled with surprise and panic. In response, I desperately tried to hang on to my fainting consciousness, but all my efforts were futile, and I fainted right in front of my daughter. When I came to... I was in a hospital bed, after having been rushed to the ER. My daughter was there, clutching my hand tightly, refusing to let go. I must have given her quite a scare. I was filled with guilt, about to apologize when she spoke before I could. Mommy, the baby in your tummy says they don't want to get erased by Daddy. At her mysterious words, I held my breath in surprise. My name is Linda Williams. I'm a 27-year-old homemaker living with my husband, Mark, who is two years my senior, and my four-year-old daughter, Sarah. I used to work as a sports trainer until recently when I had to quit. The reason? I'm expecting our second child. 
I really didn't want to quit, but after my pregnancy was discovered, I started feeling unwell more often and had no choice but to leave. I was depressed after quitting a job I loved, but there were also good aspects. Up until then, Mark wasn't very helpful with housework or child raising, but he started taking the initiative for my sake. I'm worried about my health, but I'm glad that Mark is changing. At that time, I thought everything would be okay. Mommy, wake up. It's morning. When I woke up to Sarah's innocent voice, it was 7 a.m. The school bus for Sarah's daycare arrives at 7.30 a.m. I jumped up in a hurry. Shoot, Sarah, we need to get ready quickly. What's wrong? We overslept. If we don't hurry, the bus will be here. While brushing my confused Sarah and leaving the room, I realized that I hadn't seen Mark anywhere. He usually leaves around 7.15 a.m., so he should still be at home. Huh, maybe he's downstairs. Maybe he's having breakfast. Although a little annoyed that he didn't check on us, I headed for the stairs. That's when it happened. I slipped, and I felt a momentary sensation of being thrown into the air. I'm going to fall! Instinctively reaching out for the handrail, I managed to grab onto it and prevent myself from tumbling down the stairs. Oh, that was close. I put my hand on my stomach immediately, but I didn't hit it, and it doesn't hurt. Just as I breathed a sigh of relief, Sarah, looking pale, rushed over. Mommy, are you okay? I'm fine, honey. Sorry for scaring you. Regaining my footing, I embraced Sarah. Then, Mark, who must have noticed the commotion, rushed over from downstairs. What happened? I slipped and almost fell down the stairs. Whoa, be careful. I'm sorry, but it was like the floor was slippery. What? And the floor seems to be cleaner than usual. I hadn't noticed until now, but the wooden floor in the hallway was sparkling, as if someone had polished it. Then Mark said in a flustered manner, Oh, right. I waxed the floor last night. Wax? Why would you do that all of a sudden? I noticed it while cleaning the floor, but I guess I got a little too excited. I'm sorry. Oh, I see. I was surprised by the idea of him waxing the floor, which was something he had never done before. But he had been doing a lot of housework recently, so perhaps he had started noticing the little things. Once men start paying attention to details, they just can't stop, can they? Even though I found it a bit strange, I decided not to worry about it. A few days later, on a Sunday, Mark had to go to holiday work, so I decided to take Sarah to the park, just the two of us. Before, I would run around and play with Sarah, but I can't do that now. I watched Sarah playing on the swing, a water bottle Mark had prepared for me in hand. Who would have thought that Mark would start preparing things like water bottle for me? When Sarah was first born, Mark was so uninterested in anything to do with the house, it still brings tears to my eyes when I think about it. He also had no interest in Sarah, so every time I say something to him, he gets grumpy, and coming home from work became later and later. The fact that he now prepares a bottle of water for me is still a shock. But I can't hide how happy it makes me. Thinking about this, and feeling a bit thirsty, I decided to take a sip of the tea Mark had prepared for me. Then, huh? Mommy? After drinking about a quarter of the bottle, I suddenly felt dizzy and began to feel unstable on my feet. I grabbed onto the fence of the swing for support, but even then I could feel my strength fading and it became increasingly difficult to stand. Mommy, what's wrong? Ugh. Ugh. Mommy, Mommy! Hearing Sarah's surprised and worried voice, I desperately tried to hold on to my fainting consciousness. If I faint here, I'll leave Sarah alone. But even with this thought, I fell right there while protecting my stomach. When I came to... The first thing that hit my eyes was a stark white ceiling. For a moment, I didn't understand where I was, but then I noticed the smell of disinfectant and the figure of a nurse appearing saying, 
Are you all right? I realized then that I was in a hospital. At the same time, I thought of Sarah. Excuse me. Sarah, do you know where my daughter is? She should have been with me when I fainted. I sat up and asked the nurse. She said, Ah, and seemed to understand immediately. Maybe trying to reassure me, she smiled at me. She came to the hospital in ambulance with you. She should be with your husband now. My husband? He left work early to come here. He arrived a little while ago. He's such a caring husband. The nurse said that she would go and call them, and then left the room. Feeling relieved that Sarah was not alone, my head started to spin again, and I collapsed on the bed. Why? When there was no issue during my previous prenatal checkups. Was it because I moved around too much, or did I eat something bad? As these thoughts spun around in my head, I suddenly remembered the tea from the water bottle that I had drank just before I fainted. Come to think of it, that tea. Just as I thought about this, the door opened, and the nurse, a doctor, Mark, and Sarah came in. Mommy! Sarah, I'm glad. I'm sorry for leaving you alone. I'm okay, but what about Mommy? Are you okay, Mommy? Yeah, I'm all right now. As I patted the head of Sarah, who had rushed over to me, the doctor smiled next to me. In the end, it was decided that I would be hospitalized for two or three days. After a thorough examination by the doctor and the nurse, they left the room. Mark said, I'll go buy a drink, and he also left. In the hospital room, it was just me and Sarah. Then, Sarah seemed a bit restless and looked like she wanted to say something. What's up, Sarah? Mommy, can you keep a secret from Daddy? Huh? Okay, but why? Although I was wondering why, I nodded in agreement, and Sarah brought her face closer to me with a serious look. The baby is saying that they don't want to get erased by daddy. Huh? I was momentarily speechless, unable to understand what Sarah was saying. Sarah then pursed her lips in dissatisfaction and spoke a little louder. The baby is saying daddy's being mean and the tea in the water bottle. At these words, I was taken aback because I too had sensed an unusual bitterness in the tea from the water bottle. At the time of drinking, I thought maybe Mark had bought a different type of tea than usual and didn't give it much thought. But thinking about it now, I was hit by a terrible dizziness just after drinking that tea. I had a slight feeling somewhere in my heart that there might be some relation to the fainting incident. But what does it mean by the baby is saying? Hey, Sarah... I'm sorry I'm late. The cafeteria was crowded. Just as I was about to ask Sarah properly, Mark came back into the room. I swallowed my words in surprise, and Sarah seemed uncomfortable and buried her face in the bed. Mark looked at her with a puzzled expression. Something happened? Nah, it's nothing. Hmm. Well, whatever. I'm going home for today. I have to work tomorrow. Just rest up, okay? Mark took Sarah's hand and left but my daughter showed a momentary reluctance to leave. Let's go home with Daddy today. Mommy is staying at the hospital. Uh, okay. I can't help but feel uneasy about my daughter, who followed him without saying anything. I wonder if Sarah is okay. I was worried, but there was nothing I could do at the moment. I just had to make sure I could be discharged as soon as possible and crawled into bed. But I couldn't fall asleep easily as Sarah's puzzling words kept coming to my mind. Three days later, I was allowed to discharge. As my husband was working, my friend Kimberly came to pick me up. Kimberly was a friend from the same gym I worked at. She has been looking after me since I quit due to my health condition. I was shocked to hear you had fainted, but you seem to be doing much better than I thought. I've been sleeping so well in the hospital that I feel much better. I'm glad. I was worried because you're pregnant. While having such a conversation in the car heading home, I felt a bit uneasy inside. I had been constantly feeling sluggish and heavy-headed, but the discomfort improved in just a few days. The only unusual things I had done during that time were taking a break from housework and childcare 
and eating a balanced diet in the hospital. Upon thinking that, I suddenly realized something. So that means I didn't eat Mark's cooking yesterday. I remembered there had been several oddities since Mark started doing housework. Aside from almost slipping on the wax, there were other things that bothered me. For instance, things were placed in spots where they usually aren't, causing me to trip. Or the time, I was told the shower was ready, but it turned out that the hot water tank was empty and cold water came out. Such incidents occurred frequently, especially when cold water came out. I rushed to the hospital out of concern for the baby in my belly, as it was in the winter. Fortunately, there were no problems, but it was a really nerve-wracking event. Of course, I thought these were just mistakes due to Mark's inexperience with housework. However, reconsidering now, each of them seemed to be something that could lead to irreversible consequences if one step was wrong. Landa, we're here. Ah, oh, yeah. Before I knew it, we'd arrived at the house. Seeing my silence, she looked at me with worry. If you're feeling sick, you should say so, okay? Yeah, I will. Well, you should rest for today at least. I'll pick up Sarah, okay? Thank you, I appreciate it. As we got out of the car together, I thought to myself that I should talk to Sarah properly once she's back. In the evening, Sarah returned home with Kimberly. She even bought some deli food for dinner and said, Call me if anything happens, before leaving. She was like a superhero. I silently jumped for joy in my mind. Having dinner with the deli food that Kimberly bought, I felt unusually well, so I decided to talk to Sarah again. Can we talk a bit more about the other day? I asked, and Sarah nodded seriously. Can you talk to the baby in my belly, Sarah? Yes, Sarah nodded firmly. It was hard to believe, but I felt that there was no falsehood in her words. Then can you tell me again what the baby is saying? Well, the baby is scared of Daddy. Why? Daddy is trying to hurt us on purpose and separate Mommy and the baby. So the baby is clinging to Mommy with all his might. I was at a loss for words at this revelation. Her words, though clumsy, connected the dots I'd been feeling. Everything that felt off might have been deliberately planned to harm the baby. Feeling this, I shivered. Mommy, what's wrong? Are you in pain? Sarah, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Seeing Sarah's tearful face, I hastily embraced my little girl. And I made a decision. In secret. I have to find solid evidence, or no one will believe this. The next day, after watching my husband leave for work, I pulled something out of the back of the closet. It was a baby monitor we used when Sarah was an infant. If this reveals what he's doing, if it showed what I feared, the thought was so frightening. But if it showed nothing, that would be okay too. With a small hope in my heart, I hid the camera behind a house plant. Then, a few days later, I mustered up the courage to check it. I can't believe this. It's too awful. What was captured there was something unimaginable, enough to shatter my small hope. And then I made up my mind. I absolutely won't forgive this. A week or so had passed since I saw the footage. I left my daughter, Sarah, at my parents' home earlier in the day. Then I tidied up the entire house and prepared a perfect dinner before Mark came home. Mark, who finally came home, was surprised to see the lavish meal set on the table. What's going on? I could have made dinner. I can't let you do anything dangerous anymore. Huh? What? What do you mean? I didn't miss the flash of caution in his eyes. I mean exactly what I said. What have you been feeding your pregnant wife all this time? I don't get it at all. My health has improved significantly since I stopped eating your cooking for the past week. What's that supposed to mean? I had pretended to eat my husband's cooking and threw them all away. When I told this to my husband, he was slightly shaken. Also, when I checked around the house, I noticed the non-slip pad under the rug was missing and the anti-tip device on the bookshelf next to the bed was removed. I got goosebumps when I found these. These weren't just targeted at our baby. It implied 
I was also a target. When I glanced at Mark, his mouth was twitching as he tried to force a smile. Now that I think about it, there was a time when body wash had spilled on the bathroom floor after shower, and things fell from shelves. If I'd fallen and hit my stomach, it would have been a disaster. Those are just coincidences, right? Maybe I just made a little mistake. I thought so, too, until I saw this. I thrust my phone in front of his face, and when I played the footage recorded on the baby monitor, there was Mark talking on the phone with someone, and his voice was clearly recorded. I get it, but it's not going as planned. It's surprisingly hard to make a person disappear in an accident. Well, two people. It would be best if the baby in the belly could disappear, too. Those words from the video sent chills down my spine no matter how many times I hear them. Watching Mark, he was shaking minutely and trembling in silence. Despite being wary, I continued to speak. The person on the phone is a woman, isn't it? Once I'm gone, you're talking about doing this and that. Things too disgusting to even mention. That's bullshit. You're spying on me like this? I'll sue you. How dare you? Do you even understand what you've done? Sh shut up. Just shut up. No longer able to find excuses, Mark, his face bright red, lost control and lashed out at me. Instinctively, I hunched over to protect my stomach. Just as I did, a loud bang sounded, and the next moment, I heard Mark scream. Landa, are you okay? Kimberly, thank you. I looked over with relief to find Kimberly, who easily subdued Mark and was laughing. In fact, she's a strong woman who has won the national wrestling tournament multiple times. For the day, I had asked Kimberly to stand by in the next room just in case. Mark, pinned down by Kimberly, was already reddening his face and bellowing. You think you're alive because of who? Me, right? Yet annoying demands to play with the kids and help with housework. If you all would just disappear, I could live freely. Just get lost for my sake, you idiot. So that's what you think. But thank you. Huh? Actually, you just helped me a lot by self-destructing. Saying so, I thrust my phone, which was in call mode, in front of Mark. The call was to 911. Actually, it had been in the state for a little while before, so all of Mark's words had gone straight through to the police. Please, not the cops. Mark was struggling to escape, but Kimberly had him firmly pinned down and he couldn't move. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please, I apologize. Forgive me. That's not something you can get away with just by apologizing. What you were about to do? Don't say such things. While Mark was thrashing around, the sound of several footsteps and a voice saying, We're coming in, echoed, and the police officers entered through the door that was already unlocked and in no time, Mark was taken away. Even on his way, Mark was pathetically clinging to me and pleading like, Help me! A subsequent investigation revealed the plan by Mark and his mistress. The objective was to eliminate me, who was in their way, so they could be together. Even if they failed to get rid of me, they were contemplating a story that the loss of our child due to my carelessness would lead to divorce. Moreover, if they could blame it on me, they thought they could claim compensation at the time of divorce. The sheer audacity of it all leaves me speechless. But even now, when I think about what could have happened, if I hadn't noticed anything, it still sends chills down my spine. Mommy, the baby is happy. She says she can always be by your side. When I went to pick up Sarah, she said that right away. Yes, I'm so glad. It's all thanks to you. I thanked my daughter from the bottom of my heart, and tears of relief flowed. Mommy, why are you crying? The baby is looking forward to meeting you. I'm also very excited. About a month after Mark's arrest, our divorce was finalized. And a few months later from that, I gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Sarah is overjoyed at her sister's birth and has now become a very reliable big sister. Here's a celebration gift, $2,000. After giving birth, 
and returning to my husband's family home, my mother-in-law handed us an envelope with $2,000 as a baby gift. I checked the contents and then threw the envelope into the trash. Was this their payback for enduring days of being belittled by my mother-in-law and senior employees? What are you doing? Apologize to mom. I scolded my flustered husband. Can you say the same after seeing this? My husband, after checking the envelope's contents, glared at his mother with anger he had never shown before. And then he made a decision. My name is Scarlett Wood, 28 years old. I had an arranged marriage with my husband, Elijah. Elijah, two years older than me, is the eldest son of a Japanese sweets shop and was raised strictly as the heir, but he is a very gentle and kind person. From the moment we first met, I was drawn to his kindness. I want people around the world to know the beauty and delicate taste of Japanese sweets. So I work as a Japanese sweets artisan. Will you help make my dream come true? Elijah said this and presented me with a Japanese sweet made in my image instead of an engagement ring. As I was moved to tears, Elijah continued to speak. When we get married, Scarlet, you'll work as the young mistress of our shop. Also, we'll live with my parents in our family home. Is that okay? Living with my in-laws was a condition of the marriage. There's a lot that comes with marrying an heir. But as long as Elijah is with me, everything will be fine. Thinking this way, I accepted his proposal. We became husband and wife. As promised, after the marriage, we started living with my in-laws in the residence that also served as the Japanese sweets shop. Scarlet, you married into this family, so of course you should be prepared. Behave properly as the young mistress. I yes. The day I stepped into my husband's family home, I was already met with harsh words from my mother-in-law. The sweet married life I had dreamt of didn't exist in this world. Scarlet, how many times do I have to tell you? Learn our traditions properly. Please be more aware that you're the young mistress and act accordingly. It's so hard on our headmistress to have someone like you marry into our family. I faced daily criticism from my mother-in-law and senior female employees. My father-in-law didn't speak much, but when he was watching me, I felt tense and would sometimes make mistakes because of it. He would sigh loudly seeing my performance. There was no place for me to feel at ease in this house. But I was determined to work hard, earn everyone's approval, and become a wife Elijah wouldn't be ashamed of. That feeling alone kept me going. During this time, I found out I was pregnant. Take care of yourself and give birth to a fine heir. Everyone, starting with my mother-in-law, began to be more considerate of my condition. At the five-month pregnancy checkup, I learned the baby's gender and excitedly shared the news during dinner with my in-laws and Elijah. Our baby is a girl. For a moment, everyone froze. A girl? Oh, a girl. Huh. Wait, no one is offering congratulations. Elijah kept his gaze down, silently continuing to eat without making eye contact with anyone. I was taken aback by everyone's attitude. Does an heir have to be a boy? Unable to understand the Mr. Wood family's mindset, I ate my meal in frustration. The next day, everyone's attitude changed completely. Pregnancy isn't an illness. Stop being spoiled and work hard. As soon as they found out the baby was a girl, the criticism and mistreatment from my mother-in-law and senior employees returned. Why can't a girl inherit the Japanese sweets shop? I felt sorry for my unborn child, who wouldn't be welcomed into the world with smiles and blessings. I made up my mind to protect her, no matter what. I think you've noticed, Elijah. 
I've been criticized every day since I married into this family. The way they treat me since they found out our child is a girl is unbearable. One day, I couldn't take it anymore and told Elijah. He looked troubled. Scarlet, I'm sorry. I'm still in training. I don't have the right to oppose this family. Please bear with it. If you learn your job quickly, I'm sure my mother and others will stop criticizing you. I'm very happy whether our child is a boy or a girl. Please take care of yourself. With that, Elijah quickly went to take a bath. Though he tried to be considerate, I was shocked by how unreliable Elijah was. But I rubbed my belly. I can't let this get me down. I'm going to be a mother. I must become strong for that reason. With that in mind, I endured the mistreatment and criticism alone, dreaming of the day my child would be born healthy. In my in-law's home, I was mainly responsible for cooking dinner. When buying groceries, I'd pay for them first, then give the receipt to my mother-in-law, who would reimburse me. This system made it difficult to buy what I wanted since she checked the receipts meticulously. Because of this system and my mother-in-law's thorough examination of the receipts, it was hard for me to buy things I really wanted to eat. However, after becoming pregnant, I often found myself craving sour and sweet foods. Mmm, should I buy it? <sighs> but I don't want my mother-in-law to make snide remarks again. I debated while shopping, but never found the courage to buy anything. One day, though, I desperately wanted something sweet. Feeling helpless, I agonized over it before finally asking Elijah who was working in the shop. Oh, I can't help but crave sweets because of the pregnancy. Can I have some scraps or something if there are any? Sure, just wait a moment. Elijah secretly wrapped up some leftover scraps from making the sweets in plastic wrap, avoiding the eyes of the employees. Thank you. But just then, my mother-in-law appeared. What are you doing here, Scarlet? My mother-in-law's gaze falls on my hand. Well, how shameless. This is the workshop for the artisans. I won't allow you to come in here anymore. Saying this, she snatches the scraps Elijah had given me and kicks me out of the workshop. One day, as I open the fridge to prepare dinner, I find it packed with high-end ingredients like luxurious Wagyu beef that I've never seen before. Since I can't use the fridge's contents without my mother-in-law's permission, I ask her for confirmation. Can I use the food in the fridge? What are you talking about? That's for Natalie, who's coming back the day after tomorrow. Don't you dare use it. She coldly responds. Natalie is Elijah's sister. She married into a farming family and now, three months pregnant and suffering from morning sickness, she's apparently coming back to her parents' house. Returning home just three months into her pregnancy. I'm seven months pregnant and I've been used and abused being told pregnancy isn't an illness. I have a lot on my mind, but the more I think about it, the more miserable I become. So I pull myself together and prepare dinner using the other ingredients. On the day Natalie returns home, my mother-in-law is in high spirits from mourning. She had originally opposed Natalie marrying into the farming family and seems overjoyed to have her back home after a long time. I'll cook dinner today, Scarlet, so you can go and take a leisurely walk. Unusually, my mother-in-law is kind. Usually, I'm busy in the evenings and can't take leisurely walks, so I decide to take advantage of her offer. Ah, uh, the sky is so high. The sky I look up at after a long time is dyed red and it warmly envelops me. When I suddenly touch my belly, I feel the baby move. Mommy will work hard for you, so come out healthy and strong. I whisper to my unborn child. Oh, what a delicious smell. When I return home, I'm greeted by the aroma of grilled steak. As I try to enter the living room, I hear voices from the inside. Natalie, eat a lot for the sake of your baby. Peeking inside, I see my mother-in-law has lined up a variety of dishes in front of Natalie. 
at the table, my father-in-law and Elijah are silently eating steak. What about Scarlet's portion? The moment Elijah says this and looks up, our eyes meet. Oh, don't worry. I made some stew for her. At my mother-in-law's reply, Elijah says nothing and looks away from me. There's no steak for me. I can't take it anymore and quietly go to our bedroom, trying not to draw attention. I'm pregnant, just like Natalie, yet no one tells me to eat a lot. Seeing the reality that I'm being excluded, I can't hold back my tears any longer. Why do I have to suffer like this? Neither my unborn child nor I are welcomed in this house. I just want to leave this place. My tears keep flowing endlessly. After a while, Elijah comes in with a cold piece of steak. I secretly brought you my portion. It's cold, but I'm sorry for making you feel even sadder with my sister here. He genuinely apologizes, looking remorseful. I should be more assertive, but I'm not good with my mom and sister. My mom struggled with my grandma, so she probably thinks this is normal for a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law relationship. My sister didn't like me since I was little because I was the eldest son and got a lot of attention. And she's always been mean to me behind my back. They're both strong-willed and troublesome. So honestly, I don't want to deal with them. Your family issues have nothing to do with me. Although he apologized, I realize he won't particularly protect me or our child in the future. Feeling even more miserable due to Elijah's unreliability, I eat the steak he offers, though I have no appetite, thinking of the baby in my belly. Even though it's supposed to be high-quality meat, I can't taste it. I mechanically chew and somehow manage to swallow it. Life after Natalie's return is even harder for pregnant me. Scarlet, please fetch this for me. My mother-in-law doesn't hesitate to make me work, despite my big belly. Natalie, you should rest until your morning sickness subsides. Meanwhile, Natalie takes advantage of being pampered by her parents and lounges around the house all day. We're both pregnant, but even though my belly is much bigger, ugh. It's frustrating, but for now, I have to quietly endure it. Scarlet, I brought some pudding for you. The fact that Elijah started secretly buying me food I wanted to eat because he must have felt sorry for the unbearable treatment I was receiving was at least a small comfort. One day, I happened to see that Natalie's room was filled with high-end branded baby products and maternity items. I had held back and bought everything at a cheap store on the outskirts of town. Both our children would be grandchildren to my in-laws, so why is there such a difference? Ugh. I tried not to care, but it made me very sad. On December 20th, I finally gave birth to a baby girl. Elijah cried tears of joy. I'll grow up quickly and protect both you and our child. Elijah made this promise to me. When we returned to my in-law's house after being discharged from the hospital, my mother-in-law surprisingly welcomed us with a smile. Let me hold her for a bit. I handed the baby to my mother-in-law, and as expected, she was skilled at soothing the baby since she had raised two children herself. I guess she loves her grandchild after all. I felt a little relieved seeing my mother-in-law's demeanor. After a while, she returned the baby to me and took an envelope out of her pocket to give to Elijah. Here's a gift. Two thousand dollars. What? That much? I was surprised, but Elijah didn't seem too shocked. Maybe in this family it's normal to give that much as a gift. Elijah handed the envelope to me without checking the contents, so I put the baby in the crib before accepting it. I checked the contents, just in case. What? What is this? My mother-in-law looked away, smirking. Enough already. I threw the envelope into the trash. Hey, what are you doing? Apologize to my mom. Elijah panicked. Would you say the same thing if you saw this? I picked up the discarded envelope and showed Elijah the contents. Upon seeing it, Elijah furrowed his brows. 
Unbelievably, instead of $2,000, the envelope contained a bundle of receipts and invoices for luxury food and maternity items that my in-laws had prepared for Natalie. What's the meaning of this, Mom? Even Elijah raised his voice. It's only natural for the eldest son's family to pay for our household expenses. My mother-in-law shamelessly spouted nonsense. Why should we have to pay for the maternity items and baby gear meant for Natalie, who had married into our family? I can't stay silent any longer. I made up my mind to leave this house with my child. At that moment, Elijah's low voice echoed, I'm leaving this house. What? The room went quiet, and everyone, including me, looked at Elijah. Elijah glared at his mother with a rage I'd never seen before. What do you think we are? Your attitude towards Scarlet, how you acted when you found out our child is a girl, and how you always interfere with the store I was put in charge of. I've always been unhappy with it. But as the eldest son of this confectionery shop, I thought I'd endure it until I became a capable person to protect the shop. However, I've reached my limit. Our family is leaving this house. I won't take over the shop. Thank you for everything, Elijah said and deeply bowed to his parents. My in-laws were speechless at the unexpected turn of events and eventually left the room silently. Scarlet, I'm truly sorry for everything. I'll protect you and our child. I decided to leave this house on my own. But will you stay by my side? Elijah's face returned to its usual gentle expression. Yes, thank you for protecting us. Let's overcome any difficulties together as a family of three. From the next day, Elijah started looking for a new home, and a week later, our new life as a family of three began. Our new home was a small, 2DK apartment, but it was very happy and a comforting space for me. Make sure you eat a lot and sleep well when you can. And to my surprise, our new home was only a five-minute walk from my parents' house. Elijah is really a wonderful person. It's rare for someone to admit their weakness and ask for help as an adult. According to my mother, had explained and apologized for everything to my parents the night he decided to leave, asking for their help moving forward. You can always rely on us. We're so happy that you're close by. I cried at my mother's kindness. Elijah occasionally gets messages from his mother asking to show their grandchild, but he seems to only send pictures. After discussing as a couple, we decided that our family and his parents should keep a distance for a while and we never told them our new address. Thanks to that, we were able to live peaceful days. Scarlet, we're running out of diapers. I'll go buy some. Elijah actively helped with housework and childcare, and we cherished our modest happiness, living humbly every day. I'm thinking of starting my own business. One day, Elijah came to me for advice. Even though the path to inherit his family's business had been closed off, Elisha, who had been fascinated by traditional Japanese sweets since he was a child, had not given up on being involved with them. His dream of sharing the beauty and delicate taste of Japanese sweets with people all over the world, which he had shared with me before we got married, was still alive in his heart. To make that dream come true, Elijah decided to start an online store for Japanese sweets. I was inspired by him. I wanted to help him achieve his dream, too. With that thought in mind, I wondered if I could utilize the experience I had gained while briefly involved in making Japanese sweets at my in-law's house, and I brainstormed in between housework and childcare. Look at the beautiful Japanese sweets Papa made! One day, showed our child the Japanese sweets he had made. Although our zero-year-old child couldn't eat them yet, their eyes sparkled, and they laughed excitedly at the sight of gentle colors unique to Japanese sweets. Seeing that, I had a flash of inspiration. What about Japanese sweets that even babies can eat? In my head, I pictured cute baby smiles and Japanese sweets overlapping. 
As soon as I told Elijah, he agreed, saying, That's a great idea, and incorporated my suggestion. We focused on developing Japanese sweets that utilize the natural sweetness of ingredients, like sweet potatoes, instead of sugar, and the gentle colors of the ingredients themselves without using food coloring, all while making them suitable for babies. And in about three months, we created the product we had envisioned. At first, we placed our sweets in a friend's Japanese sweet shop and observed the customers' reactions. The feedback was better than we could have ever imagined, with comments saying they were perfect for first meals and birthday parties. This could work! With that thought, we started selling our sweets online, and they became a huge hit in no time. The media picked up our story, and our company steadily grew. Until the business took off, Elijah and I were fully occupied with childcare and work. However, by the time our daughter turned two, the company had stabilized and was generating a steady income. As we gained some breathing room, I suddenly thought of Elijah's family, with whom we hadn't spoken for almost two years. In fact, after we left, I heard that Natalie developed preeclampsia during her pregnancy and had to be hospitalized. Perhaps it wasn't good for her to eat high-calorie food and expensive meat from her in-laws without exercising much. She had to endure a restricted pregnancy with strict bed rest and dietary restrictions. Well, everyone must have been relieved when a healthy baby boy was born. Unfortunately, the bad news continued as the family's Japanese sweets shop went out of business after Elijah left. What happened to your parents after they closed the shop? When I asked Elijah, he said they were living modestly on their pension. Despite not having many good memories, they were still the people who raised Elijah. Two years had passed since we left his family's home, and our anger had somewhat subsided. So, after discussing with Elijah, we decided to give each of his parents $2,000 in cash as a birthday present. By the way, the amount of $2,000 came from the $2,000 his mother had mentioned as a childbirth gift. We didn't know if she remembered, but if she did, we hoped she would reflect on it. Later, we received a message from Elijah that the money we sent by registered mail had arrived. His parents were apparently very happy. Although we weren't ready to visit his family's home yet, we believed time would resolve this issue. As long as we live our lives with pride, things should move in a positive direction. Childcare is still a challenge, but with the support of my parents, I can focus on Japanese sweets with Elijah. Mom, is this my candy? Yes, Cherry. The cherry blossom petals are beautiful, aren't they? Tasty? Delicious. I'm so happy. My daughter touches her cheek with a delighted expression. This is a Japanese sweet we developed to be edible, even for one-year-olds, melting in their mouths without needing to be chewed. We made it into a cute Japanese sweet shaped like cherry blossom petals inspired by our daughter's name, Cherry. I hope this sweet, like our child, brings smiles to everyone's faces. Mom, here, open wide. My daughter feeds me a piece of the sweet. The gentle sweetness melts in my mouth. I love that face, Mom. I hope this blissful moment with Japanese sweets reaches people all around the world. My wife was an office worker at my client's company. At the time, being young, I was drawn to her quiet demeanor. I approached her fervently, and we started dating. Two years later, I went to her parents' home to seek their approval for our marriage. There, her father unexpectedly suggested that we live with them. Originally from a rural island, I moved to the city for college and fell in love with a small town during my studies. After graduation, I obtained a professional license and started my own practice in the town. Believing that it's essential to be part of the community, I actively participated in the local homeowners association, night paroles, local festivals, and other events. This helped me build a network of trust and, as a result, secure a steady income. It was only because my earning had become stable that I could muster the courage to marry my wife. Therefore, even though my in-laws' place is only an hour and a half away by train, I couldn't leave here 
where I was working. Despite explaining this multiple times, my father-in-law persistently pushed us to move in with them. Being a former civil servant, he started saying that he could use his connection to help me find a job. Although I appreciated the offer, I wanted to prioritize taking care of my current clients. I insisted on this for several hours. Finally, I disclosed my current income to my father-in-law and explained that without the relationships I had built so far, I wouldn't be where I am today. And if I were able to expand my business in the future and establish it in their area, I wouldn't mind moving in. Eventually, my father-in-law grudgingly agreed. During this whole discussion, everyone except my father-in-law was as silent as the air. No one interrupted the conversation, and my mother-in-law brought tea a few times. My sister-in-law was there at first, but had to leave midway due to work. After getting married, for convenience, I bought a condo near the station, about a 20-minute walk away from my office. My wife, whom we'll call Emily, said she wanted to continue working, and stayed as an office worker. However, after about a year, she suddenly quit her job to get her own professional license, saying she wanted to help me with my business. The exam was tough, but I could see her determination, and I thought it would be better if we could do it as a couple, so I agreed and let her attend a vocational school. However, she almost abandoned household chores while she was studying. Although I let that slide, our relationship temporarily turned tense. Within less than a year, Emily struggled to keep up with her classes and became a stay-at-home wife. She seemed calmer than when she was studying, and our relationship became better again. At one point, I thought it was a marital crisis, so I expressed my love for Emily even more and worked harder. Eventually, Emily became pregnant and gave birth to twin sons, but she began to act strangely from since then. On my days off from work, she would leave the kids and go back to her family's home by herself. At first, she said she wanted to take a break from parenting, and since both of them had started drinking milk formula and not just breast milk, I was able to take care of them. So I agreed. We had many talks about this, but my wife said she just couldn't tend to two kids at once, and since they're boys, she expected me to parent them. I couldn't quite agree, but for the sake of our children, I relocated my office to a closer location and converted it to an office with kids' playroom. We've been visiting my in-laws about once a month, but the last time we went to, my in-laws just wouldn't let us leave. I turned down drinks, telling them that I was driving, but they still served me beer, calling it tea. I could tell from the smell right away so I didn't drink a sip. By the time our children were three to four years old, they weren't attached to Emily at all and stuck to me instead. Eventually, Emily began to visit my in-laws, even on weekdays, and at times, she would even spend a week or two at their place and not come back. When it started to interfere with my work, I consulted with Emily's family but the talks with Emily's mother didn't go anywhere because Emily herself wanted to be there. Emily's father didn't answer the phone, so when Emily hadn't come back for a week, I decided to leave my children at daycare and went to my in-laws' place. When I got to their place, I could hear a loud argument even from outside. It seemed that my father-in-law and sister-in-law were yelling at each other. Hesitating a bit, I killed time at a nearby convenience store, and when I visited again, the voices had quieted down, so I rang the doorbell at my in-laws' home. The front door opened, and Emily's sister came out right away, held back by Emily's father, with Emily's mother and Emily just watching. Emily's sister said to me, Let's go out! I'll tell you everything! To which my father-in-law said to me, what are you talking about? Come in quickly! However, Emily's sister and my father-in-law were having a fierce argument at the entrance, so I couldn't enter their place. During a heated argument, it seems a neighbor called the cops, and the police arrived to cool things down. 
we ended up talking at their place. According to my father-in-law, Emily constantly being at her parents' house is your fault. Don't listen to your sister-in-law, Susan. She's crazy. But Susan snickered and said, You've been deceiving Frank from the start, haven't you? But every time Susan tried to talk, my father-in-law would interrupt and make a fuss, so we couldn't really have a proper conversation. Even when I tried to get Emily to join in, she remained silent. This was going nowhere, so I asked to talk to everyone individually on a later date. To this, my father-in-law made an unbelievable accusation. You're planning to have an affair with Susan, aren't you? Upon hearing this, Susan stood up and said, Fine, that's enough. I'm leaving this house. Be prepared to cut ties with me. Then, she walked out of the room. No one else followed her, but I followed her to the door. Susan, with a serious look on her face, handed me a small envelope and urged me to go back inside. After tucking the envelope inside my jacket, I went back to the room where my father-in-law began again. Look suspicious, ain't it? You better move in here quickly! I myself was running out of time, and I had to pick up my kids, so I calmly said, We've already discussed this before we got married. I don't have Susan's number, and I only meet her here. It's getting late, so I'm taking Emily home today. Then, I promptly had Emily gather her things, and we headed home. In the car on our way home, I talked with Emily, but she kept repeating, The kids don't like me. I don't understand boys. I'm useless. Since I still loved Emily, I told her, Stay with the kids as much as you can. Raise them in your own way, and I want you to be by my side. We picked up our kids from the daycare and went home. Emily cooked dinner, and we all ate together. Emily's cooking skills had declined, but it was still better than mine, and the kids seemed happy eating it. After dinner, unusually, the kids clung to Emily, and Emily smiled and played with them until they all fell asleep together. I had work to do for tomorrow, so I went to my office to organize some documents. That's when I remembered the envelope Susan had given me. Inside was a USB drive. When I checked it on my office PC, it contained text and audio files. The text file was a summary of my father-in-law's living together plan. Knowing that I was self-employed and earning reasonably well compared to my peers, Emily's father planned to have me move in and work from home and have me contribute my earnings to them. Despite the initial disagreements when we first met, my father-in-law seemingly believed we would eventually agree to live together and had even bought a luxury car on loan. However, he saw no signs of Emily and I moving in, so Emily's father had the idea to get Emily a professional license but her failing the exam thwarted his plan. Still, Emily's father couldn't give up on my income. After Emily gave birth, he came up with a plan to take Emily away from me and manipulated her to get her on his side. Since there was still no sign of us moving in, my father-in-law thought that if he could push the kids onto me, even on weekdays, we would have to rely on them. However, I had set up a childcare room in my office. The next step, apparently, was to keep my wife Emily at home, waiting for me to buckle under the pressure and suggest we live together. The voice file recorded my father-in-law bragging to Emily, Emily's mother and Emily's sister about the plan, as well as insults towards me and Emily when things went wrong. Emily's mother accepting this, Emily agreeing, and threatened to Emily's sister when she tried to intervene. There were also commands telling Emily to get her hands on my money and to bring that money over, to which Emily only responded with, Understood. But Emily's sister's opposition was also recorded. Lastly, there was a separate message from Emily's sister, and there was something shocking written there. Apparently, in that house, if they stood up against their father, he would punish them by starvation and economic abuse. 
Emily's sister often stood up to such a father, and every time she did, she received unthinkable harassment, such as being denied meals and not being given lunch money. Emily, who grew up seeing this, obediently obeyed her father. To stand up to her father, Emily's sister had been learning judo from the upper grades of elementary school. Of course, Emily's father didn't provide the money, but because she was good at it, a police officer relative allowed her to go to the police station dojo. When Emily's sister was in her first year of high school, she was almost assaulted by Emily's father. Of course, in a sexual way. But Emily's sister, who had been training, fended off Emily's father, and it seems there was never another attack after that. However, the way Emily's father looked at and behaved towards Emily was strange, so Emily's sister suggested Emily learn judo as well. But Emily gave up as her parents were against it. After graduating high school, Emily's sister got a job and saved as much money as possible. The plan was to eventually take Emily and run away from their parents' house. But Emily, who was raised too obediently, didn't know how to stand up for herself. I have a feeling Emily's been assaulted by my father-in-law when she was in high school, but there's no evidence. When Susan was at home, Emily would cling to her. So when Emily one day told her sister that she had someone she liked and had been asked out, Susan was truly surprised. At first, Susan would secretly watch them on dates. If he turned out to be a weird guy, she was ready to rescue Emily right away. When my father-in-law proposed the cohabitation plan, she thought I would be alright because I had strongly refused. But after seeing Emily's father's obsession, Emily's sister thought it would be best to leave some evidence for the future. Now, Emily might be assaulted by our father, Susan felt, and she wants me to help Emily as soon as possible. She is sure she can protect herself, so she only wants me to worry about Emily. If I still couldn't trust her, she had written instructions to call her work number from a public phone using an alias. Although I did trust her, I had some questions and needed to confirm a few things, so I called a few days later. Susan provided a few more details. The reason she told me to call from a public phone with an alias was because she suspected there might already be a wiretap in the office. The alias was also taken into account in case I didn't call from a public phone. And then I was told to take a moment, gather my thoughts, and get back in touch once I was ready. Emily stopped mentioning wanting to go back to her parents' home and started staying at our place. We started having little conversations gradually, bit by bit. A week after the upheaval, I came home to find Emily and our sons genuinely laughing together. It was the first time I'd seen a smile on Emily's face. I couldn't help but burst into tears. That night, Emily made a confession. She opened up about her past, her inability to defy her father, how her sister had always been there to protect her and the times she was assaulted. Her sister shielded her whenever she was around, but her father took advantage of the times when she wasn't. She had believed that she couldn't defy her father. She was scared of men, but strangely enough, I was an exception. When I confessed my feelings to her, she was genuinely happy, albeit with complex emotions. But with the support of Emily's sister, she was truly happy to be in a relationship. Around that time, her father was often out of town due to work, so there were fewer opportunities for him to assault her. However, when his assignment ended and he returned home, it was pure terror for Emily. When I proposed to her during this time, she felt like she had no choice but to cling to me. She was taken aback when her father suggested that we live together during our first meeting, but she decided to follow me when I strongly objected. Our marriage was a bliss, until her father insisted that she get a certification. 
He even threatened to reveal her past to me if she didn't comply. She had no choice but to comply, so she tried her best, but it wasn't enough. Still, she was relieved that she didn't have to go back to her parents' home. Life with me was simply delightful. She was genuinely happy when she became pregnant and we had twins. Initially, Emily's father seemed fond of his grandchildren, which put us at ease. We thought he had changed. But Emily's father hadn't changed after all. He began to separate Emily from me and our children. She was yelled at, threatened, and forced to return every weekend. Eventually, Susan moved back to her parents' home, probably to protect Emily. Then, Emily was told to abandon childcare and household chores on weekdays and dump the kids on me. As she obeyed from being threatened as usual, I set up a daycare room in my office. She said she had never felt such despair. Even though she blamed herself, to her, it seemed as if even I was trying to distance myself from her children. And then one day, my father-in-law assaulted her. Despite placing a large package in front of the door and doing her best to defend, it was in vain. Just when she was about to give up, Susan, who had sensed something was wrong, entered the room. From then on, my wife had Susan stay in the same room and she somehow managed to protect herself. The day I went to the scene of a quarrel between my father-in-law and Susan, it seemed her sister was urging her father to release Emily already. Of course, her father got angry and a fight ensued. And then I showed up. When we got home that day, she was overwhelmed with my accepting kindness and at the same time sensed that I had heard something from Susan. She was grateful to be accepted for who she is and for our sons who always enjoyed the meals she cooked. Many times, she found herself crying in secret. She sincerely wished to always stay here. We spent all night talking and crying together. When our boys woke up the next morning, they seemed shocked, saying, Dad, don't bully Mom! Emily started crying all over again, and I joined her. Our sons didn't understand and ended up crying too. We explained that we weren't fighting, but we were just deeply moved. We took the day off work that day and spent a relaxing time as a family. Then I made up my mind and contacted Susan. Surprisingly, all I had to do afterward was leave everything to her. She had not only learned about my father-in-law's unreasonable plans to live with us, but also had evidence of his embezzlement at work. She reported it, and he was arrested. It was reported in the local section of the national newspapers, which eventually led to Emily's parents getting divorced. Thanks to the lawyer that Susan hired, Emily's mother got a hefty amount of alimony and went back to her hometown. Emily's father did not go to prison, but lost everything. At first, he tried to rely on relatives, but nobody would help him when he demanded assistance with his condescending attitude. As a result, he seems to have retreated to some rural area. After that, Emily, the kids, and I lived peacefully. I think we were a very close-knit family, but unfortunately, our happiness only lasted a few years. Emily passed away in an accident. I was devastated for a while, but with the support of those around me, I managed to pull myself together after about a year. During that time, I caused some inconvenience to my business partners, but I somehow worked my way back, and now I'm doing very well even employing a few people. One of them is a son of one of my business partners who persuaded other partners to help me out because I was struggling and he kept my business connections intact. I was truly helped by those around me. Another one is Susan, Emily's sister. She helped me in many ways and now after losing her job partly because of that, she is working for me as a secretary. 
And now she is dating one of my staff members, and they've both approached me to discuss the possibility of getting married. I'm thinking of celebrating this with my son, who Emily left behind. The other day, I received a letter from Emily's father. The content was all over the place, but to summarize, it said, I can come live with you if you want, and send me compensation and travel expenses right away because I'm coming over. So I immediately had my lawyer send him a warning. At the beginning of the letter, he even apologized, saying, I was wrong at that time. But he always sends a letter around the anniversary of Emily's death, saying, It's been a long time now, so the statute of limitations must have expired, right? He's probably still aiming for my earning. I'm aware that he's in a tough situation and is ostracized by his neighbors because of his bragging. Once our sons grow old enough, I think it's time to settle this myself. Of course, I won't break the law, but I need to show him a further taste of hell. Until then, every time I remember this man, I'm fueled to work harder and get a greater revenge at him. Emily must have had a tough time growing up being abused by her father since young. Despite having her sister and me to protect her, the fact that she couldn't escape from her father's control might suggest that she was practically brainwashed. Sadly, she passed away early, but I believe that she had a happy time in her last few years as she was able to decisively break away from her father and live peacefully with our children. I am nothing but grateful to Emily's sister, who gave me the opportunity to save Emily, and I want her to be happy for Emily's sake from now on. After three years of living with my mother-in-law and enduring her constant harassment, my ex-husband abruptly demanded a divorce. He said, let's get divorced. I want to be with a woman who's cuter than you and can have kids. As I was leaving my in-law's house, my mother-in-law also had some choice words for me. You're 30 and can't even have kids. It'll be interesting to see how you survive after this divorce. Fast forward 10 years and I get an unexpected call from my ex-husband whom I never wanted to speak to again. I have some bad news. For some reason, he's crying on the other end of the line. In response to my silence, he continued, My mom... my mom just passed away. Okay. You must be sad too, right? She was like a real mother to you. But we don't have time to grieve. We have to arrange the funeral. Can you come and help? Um, what are you talking about? My mother-in-law passed away three years ago. What? Stunned, my ex-husband then exploded in anger. I then told him the truth about myself. My name is Millie Burt, and I'm 40 years old. I've been working at an ad agency since I graduated, and now I'm a section manager. My biological mother was a free spirit who had an affair and left when I was young. So I grew up without ever knowing what my mother looked like. But life with my kind dad was happy, so I lived as if I didn't have a mother. I did get married once when I was 26. His name was Wilbur Levski. Introduced by a friend, Wilbur was a salesman for an electronics company. Millie, marry me, I'll make you happy. Thank you, I'm delighted. I couldn't have imagined then how miserable my married life would become. My dad was thrilled about my marriage. I remember feeling so happy that I could finally make him proud. As we were getting close to the wedding, I asked Wilbur, So, what are we doing about our new home? Should we start looking for a place? Huh? We're gonna live with my parents. What? You never told me that. I was shocked and looked at Wilbur's face, but he seemed unfazed. My dad passed away early and my mom lives alone. It's sad, isn't it? We have to live with her. But... Don't tell me you're going to say no to living with her after we've come this far with wedding plans. Are you that heartless? My mom would cry if she heard that. I couldn't say no after hearing that. My mother-in-law seemed nice enough during the family meeting. It should be fine. I was disappointed because I had dreamed of a newlywed life just with him. But I agreed to live with my mother-in-law. So, 
Right after getting married, I moved into Wilbur's family home, and that's when the cohabitation with my mother-in-law began. But this turned out to be the beginning of a nightmare. On the day we moved in, Louise, my mother-in-law, declared, From now on, Millie, you'll be doing all the housework. What? You married into this family, so it's only natural. Do you have a problem with that? No, I'll do my best. I had promised to keep working after the marriage because Wilbur didn't want to lower his standard of living. Meanwhile, Louise, who was still in her 50s, wasn't working at all. I had hoped that if Louise was home during the day, she could at least help with some chores. That hope was quickly shattered. Juggling a full-time job and household chores for three people was no small feat. I'd wake up at 5.30 a.m. to clean, do laundry, and make breakfast. After working all day, I'd come home to make dinner and continue with household chores. I had virtually no free time. I was always busy with housework. And Louise? <laughs> She'd leave her clothes strewn about and couldn't even bother to put trash in the trash can. I couldn't bring myself to confront her about it. I didn't want to worry my dad, who was so happy about my marriage. Louise was sloppy in her daily life, but had no shortage of complaints about my housekeeping. <laughs> Millie, what's for dinner today? Chili con carne? How cheap. It's in season and I got a good deal. Plus, chickpeas are healthy. Don't treat me like an old lady. I want meat. Make it again. Right now? We don't have any meat in the house. Then go buy some. Hurry up. I looked to Wilbur for support, but he was engrossed in his phone. Wilbur would prefer meat too, right, Wilbur? Yeah, just like Mom said. Go buy some. Wilbur said this without even making eye contact. I clenched my teeth and left the house with my wallet. Wilbur would either ignore Louise's unreasonable demands or agree with her. Maybe it was because Louise had been a single parent for a long time, but she seemed unable to let go of her son. And Wilbur was a full-blown mama's boy, <laughs> One day after about a year of this marriage, Louise said, Millie, aren't you pregnant yet? Um, no, not yet. You've been married for a year and still no baby. You're taking too long. We have our own pace for these things. Don't be so leisurely. Hurry up and give me grandchildren. Louise said that and went to her room. From then on, Louise would nag me daily to have kids. The stress was unbearable, and I started to lose weight, but I never went back to my parents' house. I didn't want to worry my dad, who was so happy for me. Despite this, Louise's harassment intensified. If I bought feminine hygiene products at the drugstore, she'd sigh dramatically and say, "'The reason you're not getting pregnant must be your fault.' That's not true. The doctor said everything is fine. Then prove it. Hurry up and get pregnant. You've been married for two years. I was doing my best to conceive, but there was no sign of it happening. Then one day in our third year of marriage, Louise asked during dinner, Millie, any news this month? Are you pregnant? No. I stopped eating and answered in a small voice. Louise then berated me, her face red with anger. Why aren't you pregnant yet? You're utterly useless. I'm sorry. Millie, you're what they call useless. What a waste. Louise, that's really harsh. Don't talk back when you can't even get pregnant. As I shrank back, Louise turned to Wilbur. Hey, Wilbur. You don't really want a wife who can't get pregnant, do you? Yeah, you're right. Wilbur responded as if it was a given. I can only think that the problem lies with Millie. I've wasted my youth. Aw, oh, poor Wilbur. Louise exaggeratedly sighed and put her hand on Wilbur's shoulder. Wilbur looked down on me with disdain. By the way, Millie, ever heard of three strikes and you're out? Uh, what? 
It means if you fail at something three times in a row, you're out of chances. We've been married for three years. If you can't have a child, then pack your bags and leave. I, I can't believe this. Millie, let's get a divorce. I want to be with a woman who's cuter than you and can actually have children. Uh, Wilbur said this and threw a pre-filled divorce application in front of me. Wilbur, are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. So pack your stuff and get out. I don't want to see your face anymore. As he said this, Louise looked at me with a gleeful expression. Did you hear that? I never liked you from the start. Sign the divorce papers and get out of here. At that moment, I reached my limit. I had put up with Louise's harassment while doing household chores for three years. I had also tried my best to have a child, and yet this is how they treat me. I can't take it anymore. Fine, I'll leave. I signed the divorce papers and packed my bags. As I was about to leave, Wilbur was already asleep in the bedroom. Louise came over with a malicious grin and spoke to me. I wonder how a 30-year-old woman who can't even have kids will survive after getting divorced. I'll take my leave now. Goodbye. Don't ever show your face here again, you jinx. And so, my married life came to an end. After that, I threw myself into my work. Perhaps because I was free from living with Louise and her constant jabs, I found work enjoyable and started achieving one goal after another. A few years after divorcing Wilbur, a man confessed his feelings to me. Millie, would you consider dating me with marriage in mind? His name was Jonathan Burt, an employee at a prestigious company we did business with. I knew his character well through work. He was sincere, competent, and liked by everyone. I never thought he would have feelings for me. I was taken aback. Thank you, but I'm divorced. I know that. It doesn't matter to me. But I... How about we start by going out for dinner? Jonathan said this with a serious look. I nodded and thus began my relationship with Jonathan. Being with Jonathan somehow made me feel at ease. He was always kind and considerate and he respected me. Before I knew it, I had fallen in love with him. Millie, will you marry me? After dating for a while, Jonathan proposed to me. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, before I give you an answer, there's something I need to tell you. What is it? In my previous marriage, things didn't go well with my mother-in-law. It was really hard for me. I don't want to go through that again. I see. How about meeting my mom first? Okay. Feeling anxious, I agreed to meet Jonathan's mother. On the day, I headed to Jonathan's family home, nervous but hopeful. Nice to meet you, Millie. I've heard a lot about you from Jonathan. Jonathan's mother, Mary, greeted me with a warm smile. Nice to meet you, too. Despite my awkwardness, Mary kept smiling and made light conversation, even throwing in a few jokes. Somehow my nerves eased, and by the time I left, I felt like Mary and I had become good friends. Mary, as you know, I'm divorced, and I might not be able to have children. Is it still okay for me to marry Jonathan? Mary smiled at my nervous question. Of course. If Jonathan chose you, that's good enough for me. All I want is for you two to be happy. Please take good care of my son. Mary, I won't interfere in your lives, but if you ever need anything, feel free to ask. I'm really happy to have you as part of the family. Thank you. I look forward to our future together. Relieved, I started to cry, and Mary gently patted my back. On the way home, I told Jonathan, Your mom, Mary, is wonderful. I never had a mother, but she's exactly what I'd imagine a perfect mom to be. Really? That's great to hear. I promise she won't ever pressure you. 
And if anything ever goes wrong, I'll always be on your side. Thank you. My answer to your proposal is yes. Yes. I'm so happy. Thank you, Millie. Jonathan hugged me with a beaming smile. For the first time, I felt hopeful about the future. Soon after Jonathan and I got married, <laughs> Mary had said we didn't have to live with her, so we rented a condo near my parents-in-law's home. We often met up with Mary for meals and trips, maintaining a good relationship. Amazingly, within a year of our marriage, I became pregnant with Jonathan's child. Mary was thrilled and supported me throughout my pregnancy and after our daughter Coco was born. For someone without a mother, this meant the world to me. Years passed and seven years into our marriage, Coco turned five. I was hoping for continued happiness when something happened. One evening, while folding laundry, I received a call from an unknown number. I thought it was a wrong number, but the phone kept ringing at intervals. Wondering if it might be someone I know, or if something had happened to my dad who lives alone, I answered. Hello? Is this Millie? It's me. The voice on the phone sounded familiar. <gasps> It was Wilbur, my ex-husband. No doubt about it. Actually, Millie, I have some bad news. Wilbur was crying on the other end. Silent, I let him continue. My mom... My mom just passed away. What? You must be sad too, right? She was like a real mother to you. But we don't have time to grieve. We have to arrange the funeral. Come over here and help. Um, what are you talking about? My mother-in-law passed away three years ago. What? Stunned by my words, Wilbur was silent on the other end of the phone. But then he started yelling. Ew. Do you think it's okay to joke at a time like this? Your only mother-in-law has just died. That's what I'm telling you. That only mother-in-law passed away three years ago. Upon hearing this... Wilbur was speechless. You... you didn't... Yes? You got remarried? Yes, I did, and I was blessed with a wonderful mother-in-law. It's unfortunate she passed away three years ago, but I'm living happily with my husband now. That's right. Mary had passed away three years ago due to illness. I was so happy that Millie became Jonathan's wife. Thank you for introducing me to Coco as well. Live happily from now on. I will never forget Mary's last words. She was the only mother figure I ever had. You traitor! Wilbur was furious on the other end. I calmly responded. You were the one who pushed for the divorce, remember? You bragged about moving on quickly. Didn't you remarry? Well, that's... Ah, so you didn't remarry. Given your personality and that mother-in-law, it's not surprising. You! Never mind. Just come and help. Why would I? No way. You... My mom has died. Are you even human? Ignoring Wilbur's rant, I calmly said, The only mother figure for me is my husband's mother. Your mother's passing is unfortunate, but it has nothing to do with me. Don't you have any compassion? I don't care what you think. I'm hanging up now. Wait. Just then, Coco hugged me from behind. Who are you talking to, Mommy? Wilbur heard Coco's voice. Wilbur's voice trembled over the phone. Mommy? You had a child? Yes. I got pregnant shortly after remarrying. Is there a problem? But Louise said you were infertile. Your beloved Louise thought so, but she was wrong. Serves you right. Good luck living alone. Goodbye. Ignoring Wilbur's silence, I hung up and blocked his number. Later, I heard from mutual friends that he somehow managed to hold Louise's funeral. However, due to Louise's personality, hardly anyone attended, making it a lonely event. The story doesn't end there. Sometime after Louise's death, it was revealed that she had debts. Wilbur unknowingly inherited the debt and is now living a life burdened by it. 
He had to sell his family home and is now living alone in an old apartment chased by debt collectors. <laughs> As for me, I'm building a happy home with Jonathan and Coco. On the anniversary of Mary's death, we always offer her favorite sweets and flowers at her grave and update her on our family's well-being. I want to be a good mother to Coco, just like Mary was for me. With that thought, I continue to cherish each day with my loving family. Divorce me. As soon as James came home from work, he dropped this bombshell on me. Hold on a minute. Did I do something wrong? Why are you talking about divorce? I'm just sick of life with you. James said, clearly annoyed. You look after the kids since they seem to be attached to you. What is he talking about? Confused and stunned, I was at a loss for words. I'm Patricia, 32 years old. I live with James, who is six years older than me, and our four children. Both of us have been married before. I met James while I was a single mom living with my daughter. James had three kids from his first marriage. And after the divorce, he took custody of all of them. Drawn to his devotion for his kids, I decided to remarry. I had a 10-year-old daughter and suddenly became a mom of an 11-year-old boy, a 7-year-old boy, and a 5-year-old girl. I thought that, together, we could build a happy family. But the happy times didn't last. A few months into our remarriage, I noticed James acting differently. He used to come home right after work, but gradually, he started coming home later. When I asked him why, all he said was, I have to finish up some work, so I'll be late coming home for a while. Don't bother with dinner. It started with him coming home just two or three hours late. But soon, he was coming home past midnight or even the next morning. His kids, my stepchildren started to worry about their dad's late nights. I tried to stay cheerful for the sake of the kids, but with James not home, I had to take care of the household chores, childcare, and even my job, leading to exhausting days. Are you okay? Can I help you with anything? Thank you. Could you go grocery shopping? My eldest stepson, Mark, is very responsible and always helps out around the house, even though we're not related by blood. Daniel and Michelle, my younger stepchildren, seemed lonely without their dad. My biological daughter, Lisa, treats her step-siblings like her real brothers and sisters. With the help of Mark and Lisa, I was somehow managing to maintain our current lifestyle. But I was getting more and more frustrated with James, who seemed to be neglecting our adorable children. James kept coming home late, without a second thought for the kids. Hey, is work really that busy? Yeah, pretty much. Can't you come home a little earlier? The kids are missing their dad. Unhappy with my suggestion, James suddenly slammed his desk in anger. I'm working these late hours for the sake of our family. You can take care of the kids on your own. That's how you say it? I just want you to spend more time at home and face the children. I was at a loss for words at James' sudden transformation, something I'd never seen before. But that only seemed to irritate him further. Can't you even handle the kids properly? I was too scared to say anything more as James shouted and kicked a chair across the room. From that day on, James was hardly ever home. He wouldn't answer his phone, leaving me anxious as I took care of the kids day in and day out. I had to work around the clock since he wouldn't give us any money for living expenses. The kids sensed the tension and began helping out around the house to alleviate some of my burden. One day, the whole family was working together to manage their daily lives. Then, one day... James came back abruptly. In his hand was a divorce paper. He said coldly, Let's get a divorce. 
I don't want to be with an old woman like you anymore. Wait, what? What did I do to deserve this? I'm just fed up with this life with you. I wish you'd reconsider for the sake of the kids. This is a second marriage for both of us. And another divorce would hurt everyone involved. The kids had finally started to adjust to our life and even started to smile more. I didn't want to cause them any more pain. You're always concerned about the kids, aren't you? What? To begin with, I don't even care about the kids. I only married you. Because I thought you'd take care of them. What a cruel thing to say to your own child. I was speechless at James' cruel words. The kids seem to like you, so you look after all four of them. What are you talking about? Three of them are your children. Think about how they feel. Shut up. Their mother abandoned them. That's why I took them in. I just want to be free. You can take care of them in my stead. Do you even realize what you're saying? I was shaking with anger at James' selfishness. So you never came home because you've been feeling this way? James smirked, as if mocking me. You actually thought I was busy with work? What do you mean? I didn't come home because I didn't want to be with you. Hanging out with friends is way more fun. So you lied about work? Yep, that's the gist of it. Having drinks at a pub, then hitting the club. There was this really cute girl there. James sat down on the sofa, crossing his legs, showing no remorse. You neglected your family to go there? He didn't even give us living expenses, yet he was out clubbing? Anger and sorrow filled me. But James had another shocking revelation. This marriage was a real mistake. Well, I'm out of money and you're of no use to me anymore. You spent money on... Clubs aren't cheap, you know. I didn't want to pay for all of it, so I took it out of your account. James said this and nonchalantly tossed a banking card onto the table. I had a bad feeling, so I hurriedly checked the card. It was from the account I had diligently saved in for Lisa's future after divorcing my previous husband. Almost all the money was gone. James should have known how important this money was, and yet he used this money without asking. Ran out of money taking that girl out for dinners and gifts. You've never even bought your own kid's birthday presents, but you've been showering her with gifts? Talking to this man was just pointless. I felt so defeated that I didn't care anymore. Fine, let's get a divorce. James grinned, as if he had been waiting for me to say that. I had always thought it was better for the kids to have both parents, but not when one is as selfish and awful as him. With that resolve... I filled out the divorce papers. Submit that to town hall by tomorrow. Me? I'm busy preparing for my next marriage. You're what? The girl I told you about? Seems she's into me. She's young and cute. I plan to leave you and marry her. Women, it's all about looks and youth, right? I felt a wave of disgust looking at James' mocking smile. What is that? Is this all because we're in the way of your new relationship? Yep, pretty much. I'll be moving out. You're on your own now. James left the house without even looking back at me. A whirlwind of anger, sadness, and regret left me collapsed on the floor. How did I end up marrying someone like this? I knew regret wouldn't change anything, but I couldn't help feeling it. How much time had passed? I was sitting in the living room lost in thought. Mom, you okay? Anything wrong? The voice of concern came from my eldest son, Mark. Don't worry, I'm fine. I acted normal, not wanting to worry Mark. The next day, I filed for a divorce. It was hard to explain to the kids, but I simply told them, we're going to live separately from dad. Daniel and Michelle were visibly shaken without their dad around, but they adjusted eventually. Mark and Lisa took even greater care of their younger siblings. As expected, James didn't pay child support. In desperation, I contacted his workplace only to find out he had recently quit. James remained missing. I worked tirelessly to support my four children. Thanks to their support, even the hardest days were bearable. A decade passed like this and my children grew up well. 
One unexpected day, long after I had nearly forgotten James, something happened. I had planned to go to dinner with the kids after work. As I was leaving work, It's been a long time, Patricia. I was stopped by a familiar voice. Turning around, there was James in worn out clothes. What are you doing here? I waited to see you. Are you off work? Can we talk? After all he had done to us, what was he thinking? Sorry, I have plans. What's up? Can we live together like before all six of us? James, who had abandoned his family 10 years ago, was now making this selfish request. By then, I could only feel contempt for him. What are you talking about? How can you say that after hurting your own children? Living together again is out of the question. Wait, listen to me. Hey, what are you doing to mom? Mark, what are you doing here? Why aren't you waiting at home? I got worried when you didn't come back at the agreed time. We were close by, so we decided to check on you, mom. Mark pulled me away from James. In the distance, I saw Lisa, Daniel, and Michelle looking concerned. Mark, you're Mark, right? James ran up to Mark. Daniel, Michelle, Lisa, it's been a while. Do you remember Dad? Dad? Wow, you've all grown so much. How have you been? The kids glared at James as he casually tried to strike up conversation. Mark, can you help me persuade Mom to? I've been telling her we should all live together again, but she won't listen. You really mean that? We should all live together again? Of course. Wouldn't it be better if Dad was around? James reached out to touch Mark's shoulder, but Mark pushed his hand away. Are you kidding me? Do you have any idea how hard Mom has struggled all these years? You show up out of nowhere, saying we should live together? That is better if you're around? I've never once thought of you as my dad. It was surprising to see Mark, who is usually so kind, this angry. Even James seemed stunned for a moment, his face slowly turning red with anger. Who do you think you're talking to like that? Have you forgotten? I raised you when you were young. What? Raising us? You always thought we were a burden, even back then. That day, you mean? The day you left us. Lisa and I heard every word of your conversation back then. My heart pounded at the memory. How shocking that must have been for the kids. It pained me to think about their feelings. Don't act like a dad now after you abandoned us. What did you say? I'm your real dad. You're taking her side over your own flesh and blood. Fueled by anger, James lunged at Mark. Stop it, both of you. Shut up. He's the one disrespecting his dad. Seeing James still trying to confront Mark, I decided to tell the kids the truth. By the way, how's Betty? Weren't you planning to remarry? James froze. At the mention of Betty, a girl from a club he frequented. Who's Betty? What do you mean, remarry? The kids asked curiously. Betty is the name of the woman Dad fell for. He left Mom to remarry Betty, who worked at the club. No way, you're lying! When I started talking, James' face tightened. Why would you mention that name? After you disappeared, I checked with your workplace. A co-worker who was close to you told me everything. Every revelation was shocking. James, who rarely went to clubs, fell for Betty, who was just doing her job. Thinking Betty also liked him, James divorced me, only to be quickly rejected by her. Mark and Lisa were speechless, knowing James left me to marry a club girl. Daniel and Michelle looked at James with contempt. Falling for a club girl? Seriously? How delusional can you be? Leaving mom for something like that is the lowest of low. That's ancient history. It doesn't matter now. Plus, there's no way I'd fall for a club girl, right? James denies the truth when the kids find out why we divorced. But what I really wanted to say was more than just that. Were you not serious? You stalked Betty, didn't you? At these words, James's face, red with anger just moments ago, turned increasingly pale. What do you mean by stalked? James couldn't let go of Betty even after she broke it off. He was so persistent that she had to call the police. He lost his job over it, too. Why would you go that far? Bold of you to show your face to us after all that happened. Our kids looked at James with disdain, as if he was something filthy. I genuinely feel guilty for what I've done to you. After losing my job, I was barely making ends meet, and now I can't work due to health issues. That's why I want to come back and start fresh with you as a family. 
So he only showed up now because he can't work. I felt dizzy at James, who was just as selfish as he was before we divorced. I swear I won't hurt you again. Please reconsider. No way. Are you kidding? Michelle was the first to speak up. Exactly. It's too late to try and make amends now. You brought all of this upon yourself. Our kids unleashed their pent-up frustrations and anger. Mom may not be our biological mother, but we love her and want her to be happy going forward. If you make her suffer anymore, we won't forgive you. Holding back tears, I told James, stay away from us. You don't want the police involved again, do you? Wh wait I still- We turned our backs on James and began to walk away. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw James slumping down, but none of us cared as we headed home. Since then, I heard James can't work anymore and lives a miserable life. It seems like his reckless past has finally caught up to him, leaving him utterly alone. As for me, I was already seeing a male colleague from my workplace. We got married a few months later. The relationship between him and my kids is great. Most importantly, I'm now living a very happy life supported by a caring husband who always puts me and the kids first.